Good afternoon, Synthesists. Today we are looking at the Roland Juno 60 and the Roland Juno 6, and we are going to walk you through step by step how to install the Tubutech or Tubutech, I'm not sure exactly how to say that, Juno 66 upgrade kit that adds MIDI and a ton of other super cool features that we are going to show you today. Um, but we're specifically going to do the work on the Juno 6, but we wanted to show you that it's the, the process itself is, is basically identical for, for each one. Um, and so we wanted to show you the inside and what to expect in each, inside each synthesizer. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is just open it up, and we've already removed the four screws. This is pretty straightforward on all the Junos. It's simply four screws, two on either side, and you can fold the hinged panel back. And uh, we just wanted to show you the inside of this Juno 60 so that you can then see and compare what the inside of a Juno 6 will look like. And it's literally almost identical. Uh, this DCB uh, input is different, obviously they didn't have that on the Juno 6. This board here is extended out further to add the uh, memory section and the, and the panel buttons and everything on the front and support for the battery and the memory but this is our our voice board here uh, this is what uh, synthesizes the audio that comes out of these synthesizers and this is the board we specifically are going to be working on today and this is the CPU we're going to need to remove and it's in the same exact location in the Juno 6 as well so we're gonna put the Juno 60 away and get the Juno 6 out so we can go ahead and get started on this Next thing we need to do is open up the Juno 6 and we've made sure it's not plugged in as I always mention. And the main part of the process of installing this modification involves removing the voice board down here and we because we need to get access to the other side so that we can remove the CPU right here. So I'm going to go ahead and make some marks on our connections so that I can know where they go back just at a quick glance. Alright, so we've got the the voice board removed from the Juno 6 and just wanted to go over it a bit here. As I've mentioned in previous videos, Roland does a great job of labeling uh, their circuit boards and so you can, just by glancing at it, can get a pretty good idea as to what's going on and, and what's doing what. And we've got our CPU and memory sections over here and if you follow this back area back here you can see that we've got our our voices essentially right in here uh, six five four three two one and you can see here these are the IR3109 chips these are your filters and then these are the noise chips here um, and you can see there's calibration trim pots for your pulse width and your frequency and your resonance down here we have our VCAs and our envelope sections uh, you can see them right here, one, two, three, four, five, six, as far as the envelopes are concerned. And then <clears throat> for VCAs, one, two, three, four, five, six as well. So they all match up with the, uh, the oscillator and filter sections on the other side of the board. But today specifically, we are looking at the CPU right here and we need to remove this in order to be able to install the Tubutech mod. So the next step is to remove this 40 pin CPU and this is by far the most difficult part of this job and kind of where a decision needs to be made as far as uh, kind of a crossroads is how you remove it uh, depending on your level of experience and the tools that you have access to. 
The easiest way to do it by far is to come in with uh, a pair of snips like this and to come in and cut each pin individually right at the top. You want to cut it as high as possible. I don't recommend coming in down here and cutting it. I recommend coming in from the top and cutting it straight up here because then once you've removed the chip itself, you've got something that you can grab onto with a set of tweezers or pliers so that when you apply heat to the solder pad, you can just pull it out. If you cut it real low down at the base, you're going to have nothing to grab onto and you can get the solder molten as much as you want. It's still going to be hard to get that pin out of that hole. We are not going to remove this one by cutting the pins. I prefer not to simply because I like to keep the original CPU intact and I have the tools to be able to remove it without damaging the, the CPU itself. And that involves basically starting by, as we did in the Juno 106 voice chip replacement, cleaning this area underneath the CPU. All these pins here and in this line here are all part of that. And then we apply flux and we're going to individually desolder and remove as much of the solder from every single one of these pins. And then we're going to come in with a heat gun. And if you decide to do it this way, I really do not recommend doing it unless you have access to a heat gun. They're not expensive. Uh, mine's right over here. I think it cost me about $50. Uh, and it's got adjustable temperature. But it allows you to get all of that final you know, any tiny bits of solder left in and around these pins after you've removed the bulk of it, you can get all of it molten at once across all the pins using a heat gun and then simply the chip will come out. Uh, again, if you don't have access to a heat gun, I'd highly recommend just cutting the pins at the top of the chip and removing it that way. I've cleaned the, the board here around this CPU a bit. Now I'm going to come in and I'm going to add some flux to the area. Again, remember you want to use plenty of flux every time you're soldering and desoldering. You will end up with much nicer jobs afterwards if you take your time and use the right tools. One of the biggest tips that I can give you if you do end up investing in one of these uh, is to keep it clean on the inside. Number two, when you, you need to make sure that your heat is set properly, I only have it set at number one right now, which is plenty of heat for this. And then when you actually place the suction and the tip onto the pad, let it sit there for a second before you start pumping. If you start pumping immediately as you press it down, you're just going to melt the very top layer of solder on that pad. And if that happens, it's much more difficult to get the solder out. In fact, the best way to do it is to go back and add more solder to that pad to raise it up again, then reapply the tip, get it nice and liquefied, and then apply the pump to suck it out. So I'm going to remove a cup of the solder from a couple of these pins by hand just to show you how I again would do it with solder braid or solder wick. I would come in and apply heat directly to the pin itself and warm up that solder and then bring my braid down here and get it up there nice and close on top of that pin and let it sit there for a second and we've removed the solder from that pad. Same thing over here, I'm going to come in and get it get it warmed up and then bring in my braid when in doubt you know don't leave your heat on there too long come back in again try it again worst case scenario don't hesitate to just add more solder back and try it again The way I like to do this is to use a little metal tool like this, just something with a kind of a flat bladed edge on it, and I'll stick it gently underneath the chip on this side of the board. I am not trying to apply any force to pull this out. I just want to 
have a way to encourage it to move off the board once I get the solder molten on the side. So do not apply any pressure to this to start prying it out, otherwise you're going to start pulling traces. But now I'm going to come in with my heat gun on the other side of the board and start to melt any remaining solder on the pins. And over time, as I just kind of use my fingers to play this little uh, this little piece of metal, I, I can feel it getting softer. So you just want to be very gentle. Sometimes it takes a while as well to get it warmed up to where we need to be, and we might, we might need to add some more heat over here as well. Gently, the chip is coming out on its own. It's almost just gravity bringing it out right now. And our chip is out. So right here I'm just checking to make sure that we've in fact removed all the solder from each and every pinhole before I go start trying to stick any sockets or anything in there because if for some reason you haven't gotten the last bit of solder out of each pinhole uh, you could end up bending pins on the new chip or socket that you plan to install. I just like to come through and double check each hole and make sure that it's, it's feeling like uh, my little metal rod here is going in smoothly without a lot of resistance. If I did find one, oh, here's one, okay. I bring over my, my solder gun or my solder iron here and just bring it and touch the piece of metal and you see it slid down there right on its own. That's because it's melted that solder. So this is a good way I find of, of clearing that hole if you have solder stuck deep down inside of it. Uh, or if you go with the, the method of just cutting the pins, that's another way you can force the, the cut pieces of the pins out of the the through holes themselves. These are all feeling just a little sticky, but that's just the old flux left over. This rod seems to be sliding down into the necessary holes very easily in every case except for that one. So we are good to go, and I'm going to clean the board again. As I always recommend in between each and every step, The cleaner the pads you have, the better your solder joints will be. We're going to flip it over and do the top. And the hardest part by far is done. For those of you attempting this for the first time, take your time. If you get frustrated, do not continue. Take a break. Come back to it the next day uh, because I can tell you that if you rip out pads or worse yet traces repairing that damage is much harder than removing this chip itself so you're just going to make it more difficult and likely need to take it into a tech if you cause damage one of the main reasons i like to remove the original cpu intact uh, when i do this not just for originality but when you get this kit from w tech they include a socket for you to put the new updated chip in and for my own synthesizers and for my customers synthesizers it's very easy to go ahead and install the sockets and then as you put the new chip in take the old one put it onto this foam pad here and then I will simply take this and tape it down inside the synthesizer and then close it back up so that if the owner, future owner or current owner or whoever wants to actually revert to factory functionality at any time, it's as simple as pulling this chip back out, removing the Tubutech chip and socketing it back into its original location. But there's no soldering involved because again, we're gonna add this socket and you just have to pull uh, the old or new one out to replace it and switch the other one back in. So when you install this, 
The very first thing you want to make sure of is that this notch you see here lines up with the notch on the circuit board. All of these chips, large and small, have different numbered pins on them, pin 1 through 8, 1 through 28, it really will vary depending on the chip, um, and that they have to go in in a certain way, so we want our socket to also match that. So this is the first thing we're going to install. We're going to install the socket itself, so I'm going to grab a piece of tape to hold the socket down while I flip the board. Painter's tape, frog tape works fantastic for that. And I'm just going to lightly tape it down. It doesn't have to be anything serious because we're just going to flip it over and now we're going to solder in all these pins uh, for the socket that we just installed before we put in the new CPU itself. So I've already cleaned the board and I'm going to cut them back in with flux. Okay, so now it's time to solder in the socket. I've got my 60-40 blend lead solder and I've gone in and applied flux to all the pins. I've got my soldering iron all set up right here and I'm going to clean off my tip. I have my iron set to about 635 degrees Fahrenheit and it's a nice low temperature. You don't need a ton of heat. These are small pins. Um, so I'm just going to come in and go one by one. take a lot of time, does not take a lot of heat, does not take a lot of solder. And when you're doing it, it's good to work backwards like this. If I were to start from this end and then move forward, I'm going to stick my iron into the old pad I'll show you. So if I come in here and I start from this side and I solder this, this first one, and then I move on to the next one, as I bring my soldering iron in here, I'm going to have a tendency to potentially melt that old pad again, or melt that last joint, which isn't a big deal but it's it's definitely easier to start from the opposite side and work your way down so that the pin immediately adjacent isn't already soldered not critical but helpful tip Next thing we need to do is put the module or the voice board back in the synthesizer, but we need to add a few more parts, and one step involves getting underneath to the circuit board that handles the bender panel and all of this here, so we need to remove the bender panel itself. There's four screws underneath. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and open up the synthesizer. It's not plugged in at this point. And we've removed the four screws from underneath the bender panel. We still have the voice board removed from the synthesizer. And I'm going to go ahead and start by flipping this over so you can see what it looks like underneath it. So there is our bender board right there. And we're going to have to solder a few components to the bottom of it. You may end up needing to cut one or two of these zip ties just that you could flip it over and get better access to it without putting a bunch of pressure on all the cabling. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and do that. At least for this one on the corner here. Okay, so before we move on, I really recommend at this time before you reinstall the voice board that we get our drilling over with now. And you might not have to drill if you've got a Juno 60 and you're okay removing the DCB jack that goes right here. Tubutex sells a nice uh, pre-built little panel to install the MIDI jacks in its place. You don't have to do any drilling. But if you're like us here and you've got a Juno 6, there is no place to do that and we've got to go in and we've got to drill from the back panel and we're going to install our two MIDI ports back here somewhere and we are going to flip the synth around. You don't want to be drilling in 
with this down and then have the, the, cir the circuit board down here because you could cause damage and certainly metal flecks are going to go everywhere. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to flip the synth around. And this is a point in time where you need to be really careful and you need to decide where specifically you want to put these jacks. I would recommend either right here and here or right here and here. It's really up to you, um, but either one of those places will have room uh, when you go and put the board back in. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put some, some tape over this the area I plan to drill. WTEC included a nice little wax paper overlay to so you can get a good idea as to how and where these should fit and fit best. Um, but before I drill, I'm going to tape this area just so that we can mitigate any potential damage to the rear panel itself. And I want to line these pieces of tape up really nice because they're also going to be my references when I do put the holes in to make sure that they're nice and straight as well. got our little template lined up as best as we can. Uh, again, just try to use the surrounding screen printing and these edges as a guide to get it lined up as nicely as possible. I prefer to put my jacks here versus over here just because it's where the rest of the jacks are. And the next thing I recommend is you have some sort of punch tool uh, so that we can make little dents uh, exactly where we want to drill and that way we can prevent our drill from sliding across the metal on accident. So I'm gonna to try to line this up really closely. Okay, so before we drill, we're drilling pretty close to this, this wiring harness here as well as this other circuit board. So I'm actually gonna clip another one of these zip ties here so that I can get this wiring harness out of the way. You do not want to accidentally have your drill bit come through and catch on to that wiring harness because you're gonna be doing a lot of repair work. So I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna put a towel down just in between wiring harness and the rest of the circuit boards itself and where I plan to drill. You're going to need to be careful when you drill because it's going to have a tendency to catch that towel on the inside, but better to catch a towel than to catch your wiring harness. So now I'm going to come in and I'm going to line up my holes very nicely. I'm going to feel where I where I grabbed that, uh, uh, that or mark that dent with the punch and I'm just going to come in and take my time. Okay, so now I've switched to this stepped bit. We're actually gonna have to go up one more size, but I just like starting small and taking my time and working my way up because then you get nice holes that way. As soon as I start stepping in, I'll usually stop and just take a quick look. Make sure I'm not causing any problems inside. Pull that wiring harness out of the way this side. Okay, that's pretty 
clean, so now I'm going to switch to the larger bit. Okay, so now that I've gotten those holes in, I'm just going to pull this off because we don't need this guide anymore. I'm probably going to have to do a bit more drilling to get the holes just right, but I want to be able to have a, a nice view of what we're looking at here. And you can see our holes came out nice and clean. Uh, I'm going to have to deburr them in a second, but the tape also helps to keep any of that these metal flakes from inside the synth. And when you see these, again, make sure that you haven't accidentally let a bunch of these fall on the circuit boards on the inside because you're just asking for something to short with these flying around inside the synth. So next step, we are going to go ahead and reinstall the voice board here, and I'm going to go ahead and make sure it's in its correct location, and I'll probably put a few of the screws back for now just to make sure it's held in place where it needs to be. To install the new CPU, it's really simple. I'm just going to undo this rubber band. And if you remember earlier, I was talking about a notch on this on the uh, circuit board itself, and then a notch on the socket. And that same notch is here on the chip itself. So you want to make sure when you put it in that you've oriented it that way. And it's really critical that you not bend any of these pins as you put it in. So I always like to just line it up as best I can and then come in very closely, even with a flashlight if I need to, and make sure that all the pins are looking like they're going to go down vertically. And I, you just apply pressure and it'll go straight in just like that. Okay, so as part of this kit, there are a couple of components. You have to add small components, including these two capacitors here and here, as well as four different resistors of three different types. And I'm just going to briefly tell you how to read a resistor really quickly, but it's really easy to do. If you just Google resistor color code chart, you're going to find a million of these that come up. But basically, you read a resistor from left to right. So in this case, it's red, black, orange, and then gold is what we can see here. So red is on the left, black, or I'm sorry, then black, then orange, then gold. And gold or silver band is just a tolerance band, like within plus or minus 5% or 10% tolerance. So when I'm looking at the resistor color code chart, I know that red stands for a value of 2, black stands for a value of 0, and then the orange band is my multiplier band in this case, which is uh, three zeros or, or 1,000. And so this is a 20K resistor because it's two zero plus three zeros, which are represented by that orange band to a tolerance of 5% because it has a gold band on the end. One other thing you need to know for this is that resistors by design are not uh, bipolar, they are unpolarized, so you can install them in any direction. They are going to provide the same resistance either way. And these capacitors that we're working with in this particular uh, job are not bipolar either, so you do not have to worry about a positive or negative side on any of these parts.
So on the Juno 6, we're going to connect the capacitor to this pad right here. You can see I added some flux ahead of time. I'm just going to make sure it's seated in there very nicely. So the first step in making modifications to the bender board is we need to solder this 20K resistor right here in between pins number 22 and pins number 24 right here and here. So I'm just going to add a little flux to those two pins. Okay, so as you can see here, we, and as we showed in the video, we've connected all three of these components together. The uh, 30K resistor, the 180K resistor, and the capacitor. Again, it doesn't matter which side you connect them to. And per Tubbytex instructions, it wants us to solder this leg of the capacitor onto this pad right here. So I'm going to melt that down and get that in there nice and nice and solid. Then it asks us to solder the second leg of the capacitor to this other pin right down here. So I'm just going to bend the leg around, try to avoid it touching any other components, and it also will provide us with a just a firmer hold there in general when we try to solder it down. Just make sure it's not shorting anything. And then it asks us to connect the other leg of the 180k resistor to this solder joint right here. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to line it up real nice and just kind of bend it around the pin. Bend it down so it's just sitting there real nicely when I come over to solder it. Put some flux down there. Okay, so there are going to be some unused wires when you're done with this. Uh, to me, it looks like it's the yellow, the green, and the brown are unused. Because the orange and the red are being used, and then these other ones, let's see here, blue, purple, gray, white, and black are going for the MIDI. So, MIDI in, there's two letters in the word in, and there's only two wires that go to a MIDI in jack. Whereas MIDI out is three wires. And it also happens to correspond with the fact that MIDI out is three letters in that in that word. So I'm going to go ahead and start installing these. Okay, so there's a brief calibration process that needs to be done specifically for this bender panel right here um, and we're setting the, the range of it um, and up and down a fifth. The first thing it wants us to do is to hold and play E5. Should probably turn down. And then it wants us to hold the bender in its leftmost position and adjust for 440 hertz. which we've already gone ahead and done. But if you need to make an adjustment, you would just change it right here. Now, we're gonna go and we're gonna hold D4. One, two, three, four. And we're gonna push this all the way up. If I can make it happen at the same time. And we're gonna adjust this one. 
for 440 hertz as well. Okay, one of the last steps I like to do that I mentioned earlier is to take some painter's tape, put the original CPU on a piece of foam, simply place the original CPU right down here. It's not in the way of anything and it will be there nice and safe. Okay, so to recap, we desoldered and removed the original CPU and replaced it with this WTech Juno 66 mod upgrade and we placed the old CPU in some foam and taped it to the inside here in case the myself or any future owner ever wants to revert it back to factory specs the original CPU is right there for you to swap back in we also soldered some very basic components to the underside of the filter circuit and the underside of the panel board to enable us to do things like pitch bend over MIDI, that sort of thing. And we finally drilled two holes in the back and installed our MIDI in and out jacks back there.